So my name is Dr. Larry Rosen. I'm a professor emeritus at California State University, Dominguez Hills. I've been studying the psychology of technology since the mid-1980s, when there weren't even desktop computers, hardly. There weren't laptop computers, there weren't smartphones. And we've been following the trends that happen with the use of technology over the last 35 years. You know, I'm really interested in a couple of things. Um, first of all is this sort of concept of what, why, and how. And the what is, what's going on? What are people doing with their technology? Um, in particular, we're focusing on smartphones because that's where people are spending most of their time. So we've been doing research where we've been putting apps on people's phones and looking at how much time they're spending on their phone each day and what they're doing on their phone. So that's the what. The why is a model that we've been building as to how do you predict an outcome from psychological variables that then predict technology use variables or mediators that then predict something like, say, a bad night's sleep or a poor performance in a class or a level of anxiety and stress and depression. Um, so that's the why, working out the whys. And then the how, working really hard on trying to find solutions to help people give people strategies to help them maybe not use their phones as often, but use them more effe effectively, more efficiently. And I really portray that as trying to enhance their smartphone experience. And um, so that's where we are right now. We've done the, the what. We've collected data for multiple years with college students and high school students. We've looked at the why, and we're still working on some of the variables that seem to be predictors. Um, and now we're really working hard on defining the how you fix it and trying to find some solutions. Everything changed 10 years ago. When the smartphone came out, when the iPhone came out, everything changed. Um, the kind of research that we were doing before then was more just trying to define um, the use of technology and how it was being used in various settings. So we studied online dating, we studied video gaming, things like that. Um, it changed everything because now everybody was carrying their computer with them all the time. And now we've started to look at what was the impact of having a computer on your body 24 seven. And that changed everything we did in our research lab. We started looking at issues like what drives the behavior, um, particularly in kids, when we're talking about executive functioning, that their prefrontal cortex is not exactly complete when they're kids and teenagers and young adults. We started looking at more affective variables like boredom, like anxiety, like depression, like stress. Um, we really broadened the way we looked at the world. Yeah, I, I've seen the way behavioral scientists have aided tech companies in changing the way they present their technology in such a way that behavioral scientists are able to say, if you present your technology this way, it will get more eyeballs on your app, on your website. And I've seen that since websites, since website development started, that people would say, if you want more eyeballs, you need to do X. If you want more people to come and stay at your website, you need to do Y. What I realized is, is that over time that this has become quite insidious. It's a way of attracting, and particularly attracting young people without them knowing it. Um, and it's not accidental, it's on purpose. I mean, for example, some of the social media sites pride themselves on holding back your likes or your favorites or whatever their, their little pat on the back is and then lumping them together because they know that more likes together make you feel better, maybe give you a little bit bigger squirt of dopamine to feel better than if you got a like, a like, a like, a like. They lump a bunch together. So that's, that's very insidious. Um, companies like Snapchat, for example, came up with the idea of streaks where you're basically competing against yourself. You're, you're, they're gamifying their technology. And whenever you gamify something, you're attracting people because games are very attractive. And this has really turned my head over the last couple of years, and particularly talking to people like Tristan Harris, 
who worked in Google, who saw this happening very early. Um, I really feel like the tech companies need to be responsible for what they do. And it's a combination of the tech companies and the behavioral scientists that they have working for them. And I think it, we almost need a code in behavioral science like medical doctors, do no harm. Um, I think that's the kind of code we need our behavioral scientists to do because too many of them now are consulting with the Facebooks, the Googles, the Instagrams, all these companies and helping them surreptitiously behind the scenes suck young people in. And this, what we've seen is the more you suck young people in, the more negative consequences it has. So in the long run, it's just not good. So when you, when you do a meta-analysis across all the studies and you look at the psychological impact of technology, you probably find a net, is, net effect close to zero. That isn't the whole story. I think part of our problem is we have a broad range of studies and a broad range of tools that we're using. Most of those tools are self-report tools. And I think that right now what we're doing is we're finding ourselves having, in our lab at least, <clears throat> to evolve from using totally self-report tools to trying to find other ways, unobtrusive ways, psychophysiological ways, to find out what is going on and any potential harm this might cause. For example, um, Dr. Nancy Cheever has done a study which has been seen on 60 Minutes, on Good Morning America, um, in a variety of places, where what she does is bring people into the lab. She puts a little clip on two fingers. One measures galvanic skin response. One measures heart rate. She puts them in front of a screen, asks them to watch a movie, knowing there'll be a test about the movie afterward. And then she takes their phone and moves it behind them on a table about three to five feet away. And during very important parts of the movie, she texts them, but doesn't allow them to access the text. Almost every single time, the galvanic skin response spikes, showing arousal, showing stress, showing anxiety. That's a very unobtrusive way of measuring anxiety and stress. Those are more the kind of tools we need to start using. We need to start using more um, EEGs to look at brain function and what happens to our brain when we're doing, using all this technology. We use a band called um, the FNIR band that measures prefrontal cortex activity. One of the things that we've done, we haven't done a study on it, but we've done it um, on um, a National Geographic special, is to have somebody wear the band, first do a test. Um, I think we did the go-no-go no go test. So it's an executive functioning test. So first do a test without any interruptions then have them do the same test with their phone beeping constantly in the background. Phone calls, text messages, notifications, whatever. And we find that first of all, it's, they self-report that it's much harder for them to focus on the task, but also we've shown anecdotally that it requires more prefrontal cortex functioning. That's important. It's important to know that when you are multitasking or when your brain is trying to multitask, your prefrontal cortex gets overloaded. What does that mean in reality? Well, it may mean that your executive functioning isn't gonna work as well. You're not gonna have as good as an attention and focus, you're not gonna be making good decisions, you're not gonna be solving problems right, you're gonna be, your working memory is gonna be diminished so you aren't gonna be able to hold the information in your, in your working memory for as long. All of these are negative impacts of the technology. I think it's a perpetual stress inducer because if you watch the way people use this phone, they yank it out of their pocket or their purse often even without alert or notification. What is driving that behavior? What drives them to say, I got to look at something right now? What we think is driving them is poor executive functioning, boredom potentially. We have a very low boredom threshold in our new era here and anxiety. Those three seem to be the driving forces that we're finding right now. The what, as I mentioned earlier, those are the, or the why rather that I mentioned earlier, those are the driving forces. And we find that by using something other than self-report. We put an app on people's phones and we notice that it measures the number of times they unlock their phone and the number of minutes they're on their phone. Well, the number of minutes seems to be going up, but also the number of unlocks seems to be going up dramatically. 
When we first did the study in 2016, they were unlocking their phone 50 times a day. Now they're unlocking their phone, these are college students and high school students, they're unlocking their phone 70 to 75 times a day. That's a quantum increase in the amount of times they're grabbing their phone and looking at something. That's really powerful. And it's a way that you can start to get at this without having to ask people questions. So in our model, the part of the model that talks about the why has been a very difficult effort for us. Um, clearly one of the whys of why we use and overuse technology is executive functioning. When we're talking about kids, when we're talking about young adults, their prefrontal cortex isn't as developed. So their executive functioning then says, oh, look, a shiny object, I can, I can play with my phone. That drives them to distract themselves. And, and I've done a lot of research on distraction and executive functioning turns out to be a very critical variable. But when you talk about the psychological issues, there are really two main ones that we focus on. One is anxiety and it's a particular kind of anxiety. Some people call it nomophobia, some people call it FOMO. It's really an anxiety surrounding technology. And the other is boredom. Um, the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, which came first, the technology and the boredom, the technology and the anxiety, or the anxiety and the boredom and the technology? I would have to say it's the technology first. The technology really is the chicken giving us the eggs of boredom and anxiety. And those two variables together combine to make us use technology times that we shouldn't in movie theaters, in church, when, our, when we're talking to our spouse at dinner, with our kids, all of these areas, we are being compelled by our phones, by what's inside of our phones, to basically disdain what's around us and focus on this little box. One of the things that children do developmentally is learn how to use their prefrontal cortex. They learn how to solve problems. They learn how to, to develop rich interconnections in their prefrontal cortex to direct their attention, direct their working memory, direct their decision making. Um, these devices interfere with that process. These devices distract you from attention. They distract you in the middle of making a decision. They distract you from doing something that your brain is telling you you need to do. And sadly, we're all part of a grand experiment. We have no earthly clue what it means to give a 10-year-old a smartphone and how is that going to change them. Or give a five-year-old a smartphone and let them play video games for two hours. How is that going to change their brain? There are studies going on right now that are looking at that. The ABCD study is looking at that over time. There are other studies going on, I think, at UC San Diego looking at whether this technology is making permanent changes in the way our brains function. And I would argue that even if it's not making permanent changes in the way our brains are functioning, neurologically, what it's doing is it's affecting us biochemically. And what we study is biochemical changes through their ramifications on, for example, on stress responses. We know that's a biochemical reaction. Through their ramifications on on addiction, which we know is a dopaminergic issue. So these are all things that are happening to kids and young adults, and as they grow up, they're growing up with this technology that we have no idea what it's doing to them. There are several issues that we have been pursuing in our research. Um, one that is very important to me is sleep. And the reason that sleep is important is because Kids don't get enough sleep. Teenagers are supposed to sleep around nine hours a night. That's laughable. No teenager sleeps nine hours a night. Never did sleep nine hours a night um, because we know that teenagers sleep about six hours a night during the week. And on the weekends, they cram a lot of sleep in. They take a lot of naps. And they make up for some of that loss of sleep, but they run at about a 12 hour per week sleep debt. When you introduce technology, what LED-based technology does is two things. One, if you're using it at nighttime, um, the natural processes, biochemical processes at night is for melatonin to be slowly released in the evening 
slowly leaked into your brain, eventually putting you to sleep. The LEDs run primarily in the blue area of the light, of the light spectrum, and blue light stimulates the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. Cortisol does two things. One, it slows down the melatonin output from the pineal gland, and two, it wakes you up. So you cannot get a double whammy. So we've done several studies on sleep and published a big study on sleep and discovered that basically kids were using their phones right up to bedtime. They, the majority, 75% of them sleep with their phones next to the bed, either on or on vibrate. And half of those get up m one or more times at night to do something other than checking the time. And usually what they're doing is checking their email, they're checking their social media. They're doing things that are going to then destroy their sleep. So what we did is put together this model of how to predict a bad night's sleep. And it turned out that it's a combination of exec poor executive functioning. They're just making poor decisions. Leaving your phone next to your bed is not a good idea at night. That's just a poor executive function. Anxiety. And then those both drive you to use your technology at night to keep it close by and give you a poor night's sleep. The National Sleep Foundation says that you should remove all LED-based technology from your bedroom area at least an hour before sleep time. Um, Mayo Clinic says you can use it in the last hour before sleep time, but you need to hold it about 14 inches away and dim the brightness, which is very uncomfortable to do. And so basically it's the same thing. An hour before sleep, don't use your technology.